Hey everyone, Duke Nugget 3D here with some more masks in my collection, and today we'll be, we'll be taking a look at the M3 and M3A1 Army Diaphragm masks from the Second World War. These masks are pretty well known among the collecting community, I'm sure you've all seen them in one form or another, and uh, today I'm just going to be taking a little look into their history, and while their early history and beginnings aren't really as interesting, what, they kind of, what the military kind of did with them later on is kind of more interesting. So, without further ado, the M3 diaphragm was designed in, I'd say around 1940. It's possible these could have been in development since 1939, when the, uh, the M2 series training and service masks were introduced. Because, obviously, with the M2 series masks being introduced, the army had the advent of an injection molded face piece. They would need something to replace the older M1 and M2 diaphragm masks as well, which were obviously still using the um, folded sheet rubber and chin seam sort of method that the early M1 masks were also using. And with those being replaced, obviously, as said, the M3 diaphragm was the next logical step. So, what it basically was was an M2 face piece, which was reworked to have a larger um, opening on the front to fit an angle to a diaphragm angle tube assembly. And the deflectors did not meet at the chin with a singular stem for a hose, but instead would split off into two separate pieces to which a, a plastic Y tube, as it was called, connected and a hose would attach horizontally off of that, leading to the hose and the, or leading to the filter inside the carrier. Uh, the M3 diaphragm lasted the army a decent while. I believe the the, the original contracts for, by uh, General Tyro and Rubber Company started around 1941, and that continued a decent while, and I think the last of the M3 diaphragms that were produced came around in 1942, and in 1942 or so was when they introduced the M3A1 diaphragm, which was basically the same design, with some minute changes in hardware, mostly just the colors of the paint on the rivets and the fabric, and... Occasionally the harnesses were changed as well, but the main difference was the diaphragm angle tube assembly, which was the plastic C11 type. And the C11 diaphragm angle tubes would also be utilized on several other masks and experimental designs that may or may not have gotten adopted, but I, dig I digress. Both the M3 and M3A1 were used by the U.S. military through to the end of World War II, and there was a hell of a lot of experimentation with the face pieces during the latter half or like the last few years of World War II and the Cold War period shortly after. There was experimentation to make a lightweight version of the diaphragm masks, merely because the M3 and M4 lightweight masks were kind of prevalent in the U.S. military, replacing the older M2 uh, series heavyweight masks. Not entirely, but mostly. So the next logical step was to make a lightweight diaphragm mask. And I'm not entirely sure how that would have looked. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if it would have used the same plastic Y-tube deflector system or if it would have adopted a, a, chin, a centralized chin stem for the hose and filter, but nevertheless, it would have used a shorter M3 hose and M10A1 canister. Uh, the, although this lightweight diaphragm mask was never put into service, there, after World War II, a lot of these masks were reconditioned for training purposes in the 1950s, in which that the M9A1 or whatever heavyweight canister they had was lopped off or simply removed standardly and they were used without a filter or in some rare cases they had an M10A1 filter which uh, kind of throws back to the idea of a lightweight diaphragm mask but they still had the original 28 inch or 29 inch M M2 hoses which uh, both of these still have and it's beginning to there was also experimentation with a M2 diaphragm that had a M11 canister directly on the face piece, sort of like the, uh, the uh, it was similar in concept to the M8 snout mask, where it was basically an M2 face piece that had a metal angle tube assembly with a 60 millimeter thread kind of slapped onto the hose port. But in the case of the very strange um, side canister diaphragm mask, it was, they modified the Y connector to be a, sort of a, a brass angle tube that led the filter off to the side. There would be a 60 millimeter thread here where the filter would screw onto and the voice emitter diaphragm angle tube assembly was also the same like weird metallic one used on the M2 10A16 lightweight optical mask. So yeah, there was a decent amount of experimentation with these face pieces after World War II and it's not really too much else to say about it. So let's get right into the kits here. I should also mention that both of these face pieces I am currently uh, restoring. I don't know when they're going to be finished. The main thing I'm waiting on is some some proper gray-blue fabric tape to replace this garish white shit that I have on here. Because that's not the correct color. It would have been gray or gray-blue. 
Anyways, getting onto the kit here, this carrier here, which is a typical kidney bag carrier, I'll, I'll find out the designation in a moment when I open it up and look, um, is probably not the correct one that would have been used with these M3 diaphragms, given that it is marked US Universal, which would, you know, it would be correct for the markings, but all the M3 series diaphragm masks will come with a kidney bag that is marked Army diaphragm mask, so I'm not sure if these any of these types of carriers would be recycled with it. Um, as uh, if you could check out my Burel diaphragm video, I'm pretty sure I've gotten a little bit of detail about the carrier there. You have a long uh, strap which goes over the shoulder, and it's interesting because it has a little bit of a patch here, a little bit of a fold, so it more neatly contours with the shoulder and doesn't cinch up in certain areas. And this would also remove with a hook and eyelet system carried over from the M1 carriers used with the um, box respirator type masks and early TSO masks of the First World War. Um, the the waist strap is pretty much the same ordeal, just a, a broad canvas webbing strap with a hook and eyelet style closure. And on the inside here, the inner flap opens with two snaps. There is a third snap closer to the edge to, so that the upper flap can be buttoned shut and the hose would stick out of this loop here. Looking inside, you have some markings and there is the designation for the carrier, M4, and there's a lot number and there's not really too much else to see. So looking inside the carrier, you can see, or hopefully you can see, it's kind of a janky ordeal trying to get this thing positioned. You can see the M9A1 heavyweight canister positioned inside the carrier there, and there is a little anti-fogging kit below that. And I'll remove the canister to show off. It simply pulls out, undoing a snap. And here you have the filter, big boxy filter. It's not that heavy, but you know, it's kind of a, they didn't call it a heavyweight filter for nothing. Got an inlet on the bottom, got a aluminum angle tube on the top or elbow pipe on the top you got some markings with a lot number uh, and then over here you have us m9a1 in roman numerals although i doubt you could really see that let us begin the mask introductions with the m3 face piece this is the better of the two masks i have there's not really too much to see here you got the two triangular uh lenses which are made of a plastic material very early plastic you have U.S. universal size stamped on the forehead, and you can definitely notice all the discoloration speckling that's kind of a problem with these masks. I've already cleaned this mask off with acetone to remove most of the uh, apparent discoloration, but some of this heavier set stuff is quite difficult to remove. You can see the riveted harness along the exterior of the face piece here, and also notice the temple bridges, um, which retain the harness as well. And below that, you have the rifle skid on the lower harness strap and the purpose of this was so that the butt of the rifle would not be catching on the lower head harness strap it would just simply slide off into the user's cheek um, you can see how the diaphragm angle tube assembly is held in place this whole assembly would unscrew i'm not going to do it right now because i want to make this video a little bit quick um, and that's pretty simple affair you can see the m6 spearhead valve retained by a special guard and I have one of these guards not installed on the mask to give you an idea what the guards would look like. There is a variant to the M3 diaphragm where these diaphragm angle tube assemblies would be painted a gray color instead of this black. It is my understanding the black ones are the earlier ones, but I'm seeing a lot of black ones on the market lately compared to the gray ones, so that's kind of interesting. You can see the plastic um, Y-tube deflector connector <laughs> can attach to the two ports where the TSO deflectors would be and then the hose would obviously be attached to that and I do not have any wire and tape on these hoses so I can just simply pull it off to give you a better look at everything and another thing I noticed is that on the M3 diaphragm a lot of the wire and tape would be concealed with rubber bands I'm not sure why this is it seems like a logical choice but for whatever reason they eventually stopped doing that I guess for reasons of uh, expense and manufacturing and there's really not too much else to see, except the, well, actually, before I pull it off the head, let me show you the harness here. I, be I believe the harness is also designated M2. I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look into that again. You got a lot number on the back, and it's a typical six-point harness. It's sort of been the same type of harness used with the earlier M1 series masks, and it's just a six-strap black elastic. And I will now pull the mask off of the head to give you a close-up of the chin markings and show off the interior for you guys. But first, let me remove this M2 hose because it's bulky and is getting in the way of doing a review. So, if you look on the chin piece here, you can see that it is made by the General Tire and Rubber Company. Contracted on, let's see here, or this one was made on, let's see, the six months of the year uh, of 1941. I'm not going to be counting off my months now because I'm retarded. But anyways, yes, and below that you can also see the experimental designation of the face piece, E42R92. 
which was what would, it, what it would have been called before it was adopted as the M3. So that's pretty much it. So this, again, this example was made in 1941. And I will revert the harness and show off the interior. Interior is not too much to see. It's pretty simple. It's got the rivets on the inside of the face piece, a slight texturing to achieve better comfort. And then you also have the uh, speech cone or a little rubber speech cone, which would sort of direct the voice into the diaphragm assembly. And then below that was the, uh, underneath it is the port for the outlet valve, or the exhaled air to go out. Not really much to see. And it's pretty typical. Now let's move on to the M3. There really isn't too much to say else. Uh, I mean, there really isn't too much else different as mentioned before. Same M2 hose, same face piece and all that. The hardware, as you may notice, is a bit different. This one has gray webbing and a gray uh, harness as opposed to uh, black and olive drab. Uh, so that's a bit different. The diaphragm assembly, uh, again, is the C11 made out of a gray plastic. Although I have seen training examples where these were made out of black plastic, and that's certainly interesting. I'm not sure why that is. And it uses the updated M8 outlet valve on the bottom there. And this particular example is also made by the General Tire and Rubber Company, contracted in uh, July 1942. I could be wrong. It's probably not July, but I'm retarded with my months, as I said before. Either way, it's contracted 1942. Same experimental designation and same universal size. Not really much else to see on the exterior. I will show off the interior for you guys. Not that there's too much else of a difference, but it's worth mentioning something that is missing on the inside. Here you can see the interior of the M3A1 diaphragm and the interior of the C11 angle tube. And you may notice that the back plate, the, the whole diaphragm assembly will unscrew from the inside. However, I've not been able to get this off due to the aging plastic. Um, yeah, there's a lot of transparent plastic parts on these, which is interesting. And there would have been a gray rubber speech cone on here, but that is missing for some reason. Maybe not all examples were made with them. I'm not entirely sure, but most of the unissued examples I've seen have the gray uh, rubber speech cone on that uh, retainer. And you can also see the outlet port directly below that for the M8 valve. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and again, I'm still working on restoring these. Um, if you notice here, this is the biggest problem with these masks. What they have is this dry cracking right there. This is when you're buying an M3 diaphragm, this is what you definitely want to look for because that will be the first place that they will tear. But anyways, my camera's probably about to die here. So that being said, I'm Duke the 3D. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them in the comments below as always, and I'll see you all later.